They laugh, they drink, they eat, they have a good time, they gamble, they dance, and so forth, without taking any more trouble than Esau to make themselves worthy of their Heavenly Father's blessing. Briefly, they think only of this world, love only the world, speak and act only for the world and its pleasures. For a passing moment of pleasure, for a fleeting wisp of honour, for a piece of hard earth, yellow or white, they barter away their baptismal grace, their robe of innocence, and their heavenly inheritance. Finally, sinners continually hate and persecute the elect, openly and secretly. The elect are a burden to them. They despise them, criticize them, ridicule them, insult them, rob them, deceive them, impoverish them, hunt them down, and trample them into the dust. While they themselves are making fortunes, enjoying themselves, getting good positions for themselves, enriching themselves, rising to power and living in comfort. Jacob, the younger son, was of a frail constitution, gentle and peaceable, and usually stayed at home to please his mother, whom he loved so much. If he did go out, it was not through any personal desire of his, nor from any confidence in his own ability, but simply out of obedience to his mother. He loved and honoured his mother. That is why he remained at home close to her. He was never happier than when he was in her presence. He avoided everything that might displease her, and did everything he thought would please her. This made Rebecca love him all the more. He was submissive to his mother in all things. He obeyed her entirely in everything, promptly without delay, and lovingly without complaint. At the least indication of her will, young Jacob hastened to comply with it. He accepted whatever she told him without questioning. For instance, when she told him to get two small goats and bring them to her so that she might prepare something for his father Isaac to eat, Jacob did not reply that one would be enough for one man, but without arguing he did exactly what she told him to do. He had the utmost confidence in his mother. He did not rely on his own ability. He relied solely on his mother's care and protection. He went to her in all his needs, and consulted her in all his doubts. For instance, when he asked her if his father, instead of blessing him, would curse him, he believed her and trusted her when she said she would take the curse upon herself. Finally, he adopted as much as he could the virtues he saw in his mother. It seems that one of the reasons why he spent so much time at home was to imitate his dear mother, who was so virtuous, and to keep away from evil companions who might lead him into sin. In this way he made himself worthy to receive the double blessing of his beloved father. It is in a similar manner that God's chosen ones usually act. They stay at home with their dear mother, that is, they have an esteem for quietness, love the interior life, and are assiduous in prayer. They always remain in the company of the Blessed Virgin, their mother and model, whose glory is wholly interior, and who during her whole life dearly loved seclusion in prayer. It is true at times they do venture out into the world, but only to fulfill the duties of their state of life, in obedience to the will of God and the will of their mother. No matter how great their accomplishments may appear to others, they attach far more importance to what they do within themselves, in their interior life, in the company of the Blessed Virgin. For there they work at the great task of perfection, compared to which all other work is mere child's play. At times their brothers and sisters are working outside with great energy, skill, and success, and win the praise and approbation of the world. But they know by the light of the Holy Spirit that there is far more good, more glory, and more joy in remaining hidden and recollected with our Lord, in complete and perfect submission to Mary, than there is in performing by themselves marvellous works of nature and grace in the world, like so many Esau's and sinners. Glory for our God, and riches for men, are in her house. Lord Jesus, how lovely is your dwelling place! The sparrow has found a house to dwell in, and the turtle-dove a nest for her little ones. How happy is the man who dwells in the house of Mary, where you were the first to dwell! Here, in this home of the elect, he draws from you alone the help he needs to climb the stairway of virtue he has built in his heart to the highest possible points of perfection, while in the veil of tears. The elect have a great love for Our Lady, and honour her truly as their mother and queen. They love her not merely in word, but in deed. They offer her not just outwardly, but from the depths of their heart. Like Jacob, they avoid the least thing that might displease her, and eagerly do whatever they think might win her favour. Jacob brought Rebecca two young goats. They bring Mary their body and their soul, with all their faculties, 
so that she may accept them as her own, that she may make them die to sin and self by divesting them of self-love in order to please Jesus her Son, who wishes to have as friends and disciples only those who are dead to sin and self, that she may clothe them according to their Heavenly Father's taste and for His greater glory, which she knows better than any other creature, that through her care and intercession this body and soul of theirs, thoroughly cleansed from every state, thoroughly dead to self, thoroughly stripped and well prepared, may be pleasing to the Heavenly Father and deserving of His blessing. Is this not what those chosen souls do who, to prove to Jesus and Mary how effective and courageous is their love, live and esteem the perfect consecration to Jesus through Mary which we are now teaching them? Sinners may say that they love Jesus, that they love and honor Mary, but they do not do so with their whole heart and soul. Unlike the elect, they do not love Jesus and Mary enough to consecrate them their body with its senses, and their soul with its passions. They are subject and obedient to Our Lady, their good mother, and here they are simply following the example set by our Lord Himself, who spent thirty of the thirty-three years He lived on earth, glorifying God His Father in perfect and entire submission to His Holy Mother. They obey her, following her advice to the letter, just as Jacob followed that of Rebekah when she said to him, My son, follow my advice. Or like the stewards at the wedding of Cana, to whom Our Lady said, Do whatever he tells you. Through obedience to his mother, Jacob received the blessing almost by a miracle, because in the natural course of events he should not have received it. As a reward for following the advice of Our Lady, the stewards at the wedding in Cana were honored with the first of Our Lord's miracles, when at her request he changed water into wine. In the same way, until the end of time, all who are to receive the blessing of our Heavenly Father, and who are to be honored with His wondrous graces, will receive them only as a result of their perfect obedience to Mary. On the other hand, the Esau's will lose their blessing, because of their lack of submission to the Blessed Virgin. They have great confidence in the goodness and power of the Blessed Virgin, their dear mother, and incessantly implore her help. They take her for their pole-star to lead them safely into harbor. They open their hearts to her and tell her their troubles and their needs. They rely on her mercy and kindness to obtain forgiveness for their sins through her intercession and to experience her motherly comfort in their troubles and anxieties. They even cast themselves into her virginal bosom, hide and lose themselves there in a wonderful manner. There they are filled with pure love, they are purified from the least stain of sin, and they find Jesus in all his fullness. For he reigns in Mary as if on the most glorious of thrones. What incomparable happiness! Abbot Garrick says, Do not imagine there is more joy in dwelling in Abraham's bosom than in Mary's, for it is in her that our Lord placed his throne. Sinners, on the other hand, put all their confidence in themselves. Like the prodigal son, they eat with the swine. Like toads, they feed on earth. Like all worldlings, they love only visible and external things. They do not know the sweetness of Mary's bosom. They do not have that reliance and confidence which the elect have for the Blessed Virgin, their mother. Deplorably, they choose to satisfy their hunger elsewhere, as St. Gregory says, because they do not want to taste the sweetness already prepared within themselves and within Jesus and Mary. Finally, chosen souls keep to the ways of the Blessed Virgin, their loving mother. That is, they imitate her, and so are sincerely happy and devout, and bear the infallible sign of God's chosen ones. This loving mother says to them, Happy are those who keep my ways, which means, Happy are those who practice my virtues, and who, with the help of God's grace, follow the path of my life. They are happy in this world because of the abundance of grace and sweetness I impart to them out of my fullness, and which they receive more abundantly than others who do not imitate me so closely. They are happy at the hour of death, which is sweet and peaceful, for I am usually there myself to lead them home to everlasting joy. Finally, they will be happy for all eternity, because no servant of mine who imitated my virtues during life has ever been lost. On the other hand, sinners are unhappy during their life, and at their death, and throughout eternity, because they do not imitate the virtues of Our Lady. They are satisfied with going no further than joining her confraternities, reciting a few prayers in her honor, or performing other exterior devotional exercises. O oh, Blessed Virgin, my dear mother, how happy are those who faithfully keep your ways, your counsels, and your commands, 
O oh, blessed Virgin, my dear mother, how happy are those who faithfully keep your ways, your counsels, and your commands, who never allow themselves to be led astray by a false devotion to you! But how unhappy and accursed are those who abuse devotion to you by not keeping the commandments of your Son! They are accursed who stray from your commandments. End of Disc 2 Please insert Disc 3 Services of Our Lady to Her Faithful Servants here now are the services which the Virgin Mary, as the best of all mothers, lovingly renders to those loyal servants who have given themselves entirely to her, in the manner I have described, and following the figurative meaning of the story of Jacob and Rebecca. She loves them, I love those who love me. She loves them, because she is truly their mother. What mother does not love her child, the fruit of her womb? She loves them in gratitude for the active love they show to her, their beloved mother. She loves them because they are loved by God and destined for heaven. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. She loves them because they have consecrated themselves entirely to her, and belong to her portion, her inheritance. In Israel I receive your inheritance. She loves them tenderly, more tenderly than all the mothers in the world together. Take the maternal love of all the mothers in the world for their children. Pour all that love into the heart of one mother for an only child. That mother's love would certainly be immense, yet Mary's love for each of her children has more tenderness than the love of that mother for her child. She loves them not only effectively, but effectively. That is, her love is active and productive of good, like Rebecca's love for Jacob, and even more so, for Rebecca was, after all, only a symbolic figure of Mary. Here is what this loving mother does for her children to obtain for them the blessings of their Heavenly Father. Like Rebecca, she looks out for favorable opportunities to promote their interests, to ennoble and enrich them. She sees clearly in God all that is good and all that is evil, fortunate and unfortunate events, the blessings and condemnations of God. She arranges things in advance, so as to divert evils from her servants, and put them in the way of abundant blessings. If there is any special benefit to be gained in God's sight by the faithful discharge of an important work, Mary will certainly obtain this opportunity for a beloved child and servant, and at the same time give him the grace to persevere in it to the end. She personally manages our affairs, says a saintly man. She gives them excellent advice, as Rebecca did to Jacob, My son, follow my counsels. Among other things, she persuades them to bring her the two young goats, that is, their body and soul, and to confide them to her, so that she can prepare them as a dish pleasing to God. She inspires them to observe whatever Jesus Christ, her Son, has taught by word and example. When she does not give these counsels herself in person, she gives them through the ministry of angels, who are always pleased and honored to go at her request to assist one of her faithful servants on earth. What does this good mother do when we have presented and consecrated to her our soul and body, and all that pertains to them without accepting anything? Just what Rebecca of old did to the little goats Jacob brought her. She kills them, that is, makes them die to the life of the old Adam. She strips them of their skin, that is, of their natural inclinations, their self-love and self-will, and their every attachment to creatures. She cleanses them from all stain, impurity, and sin. She prepares them to God's taste and to His greater glory, as she alone knows perfectly what the divine taste is, and where the greatest glory of God is to be found. She alone, without any fear of mistake, can prepare and garnish our body and soul to satisfy that infinitely refined taste, and promote that infinitely hidden glory. Once this good mother has received our complete offering with our merits and satisfactions through the devotion I have been speaking about, and has stripped us of our own garments, she cleanses us and makes us worthy to appear without shame before our Heavenly Father. She clothes us in the clean, new, precious, and fragrant garments of Esau, the firstborn, namely her son, Jesus Christ. She keeps these garments in her house, that is to say, she has them at her disposal, for she is the treasurer and universal dispenser of the merits and virtues of Jesus, her son. She gives and distributes them to whom she pleases, when she pleases, as she pleases, and as much as she pleases, as we have said above. She covers the neck and hands of her servants with the skins of the goats that have been killed and flayed, that is, she adorns them with the merits and worth of their own good actions. In truth, she destroys and nullifies all that is impure and imperfect in them. 
She preserves and enhances this good, so that it adorns and strengthens their neck and hands. That is, she gives them the strength to carry the yoke of the Lord, and the skill to do great things for the glory of God and the salvation of their poor brothers. She imparts new perfume and fresh grace to those garments and adornments, by adding to them the garments of her own wardrobe of merits and virtues. She bequeathed these to them before her departure for heaven, as was revealed by a holy nun of the last century who died a holy death. Thus all her domestics, that is, all her servants and slaves, are clothed with double garments, her own and those of her son. Now they have nothing to fear from that cold, which sinners, naked and stripped as they are of the merits of Jesus and Mary, will be unable to endure. Finally, Mary obtains for them the Heavenly Father's blessing. As they are the youngest born and adopted, they are not really entitled to it. Clad in new, precious, and sweet-smelling garments, with body and soul well prepared and dressed, they confidently approach their Heavenly Father. He hears their voice and recognizes it as the voice of a sinner. He feels their hands, covered with skins, inhales the aroma of their garments. He partakes with joy of what Mary, their mother, has prepared for him, recognizing in it the merits and good odor of his son and his blessed mother. He gives them a twofold blessing, the blessing of the dew of heaven, namely divine grace, which is the seed of glory. God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, and also the blessing of the fertility of the earth. For as a provident father, he gives them their daily bread, and an ample supply of the goods of the earth. He makes them masters of their other brothers, the reprobate sinners. This domination does not always show in this fleeting world, where sinners often have the upper hand. How long shall the wicked glory mouthing insolent reproaches? I have seen the wicked triumphant and lifted up like the cedars of Lebanon. But the supremacy of the just is real, and will be seen clearly for all eternity in the next world, where the just, as the Holy Spirit tells us, will dominate and command all peoples. The God of all majesty is not satisfied with blessing them in their persons and their possessions. He blesses all who bless them, and curses all who curse and persecute them. She provides for all their needs. Our Lady's charity towards her faithful servants goes further. She provides them with everything they need for body and soul. We have just seen that she gives them double garments. She also nourishes them with the most delicious food from the banquet table of God. She gives them the son she has borne, the bread of life, to be their food. Dear children, she says in the words of divine wisdom, take your fill of my fruit that is to say, of the fruit of life, Jesus, whom I brought into the world for you. Come, she repeats in another passage, eat the bread which is Jesus, drink the wine of his love which I have mixed for you. As Mary is the treasurer and dispenser of the gifts and graces of the Most High God, she reserves a choice portion, indeed the choicest portion, to nourish and sustain her children and servants. They grow strong on the bread of life, they are made joyful with the wine that brings forth virgins. They are carried at her breast. They bear with ease the yoke of Christ, scarcely feeling its weight, because of the oil of devotion with which she has softened its wood. She leads and guides them. A third service which Our Lady renders her faithful servants is to lead and direct them according to the will of her son. Rebecca guided her little son Jacob, and gave him good advice from time to time, which helped him obtain the blessing of his father, and saved him from the hatred and persecution of his brother Esau. Mary, star of the sea, guides all her faithful servants into safe harbor. She shows them the path to eternal life, and helps them avoid dangerous pitfalls. She leads them by the hand along the path of holiness, steadies them when they are liable to fall, and helps them rise when they have fallen. She chides them like a loving mother when they are remiss, and sometimes she even lovingly chastises them. How could a child that follows such a mother and such an enlightened guide as Mary take the wrong path to heaven? Follow her, and you cannot go wrong, says St. Bernard. There is no danger of a true child of Mary being led astray by the devil and falling into heresy. Where Mary leads, Satan with his deceptions and heretics with their subtleties are not encountered. When she upholds you, you will not fall. She defends and protects them. The fourth good office Our Lady performs for her children and faithful servants is to defend and protect them against their enemies. By her care and ingenuity, Rebecca delivered Jacob from all dangers that beset him, and particularly from dying at the hands of his brother, 
as he apparently would have done, since Esau hated and envied him just as Cain hated his brother Abel. Mary, the beloved mother of chosen souls, shelters them under her protecting wings as a hen does her chicks. She speaks to them, coming down to their level and accommodating herself to all their weaknesses. To ensure their safety from the hawk and vulture, she becomes their escort, surrounding them as an army in battle array. Could any one surrounded by a well-ordered army of, say, a hundred thousand men fear his enemies? No. And still less would a faithful servant of Mary, protected on all sides by her imperial forces, fear his enemy. This powerful Queen of Heaven would sooner dispatch millions of angels to help one of her servants than have it said that a single faithful and trusting servant of hers had fallen victim to the malice, number, and power of his enemies. She intercedes for them. Finally, the fifth and greatest service which this loving mother renders her faithful followers is to intercede for them with her son. She appeases him with her prayers, brings her servants into closer union with him, and maintains that union. Rebecca made Jacob approach the bed of his father. His father touched him, embraced him, and even joyfully kissed him after having satisfied his hunger with the well-prepared dishes which Jacob had brought him. Then, inhaling most joyfully the exquisite perfume of his garments, he cried, Behold, the fragrance of my son is as the fragrance of a field of plenty which the Lord has blessed. The fragrance of this rich field which so captivated the heart of the father is none other than the fragrance of the merits and virtues of Mary, who is the plentiful field of grace in which God the Father has sown the grain of wheat of the elect, his only son. How welcome to Jesus Christ, the Father of the world to come, is a child perfumed with the fragrance of Mary! How readily and how intimately does he unite himself to that child! But this we have already shown at length. Furthermore, once Mary has heaped her favours upon her children and her faithful servants, and has secured for them the blessing of the Heavenly Father and union with Jesus Christ, she keeps them in Jesus, and keeps Jesus in them. She guards them, watching over them unceasingly, lest they lose the grace of God and fall into the snares of their enemies. She keeps the saints in their fullness, St. Bonaventure, and inspires them to persevere to the end, as we have already said. Such is the explanation given to this ancient allegory which typifies the mystery of predestination and reprobation. CHAPTER six, WONDERFUL EFFECTS OF THIS DEVOTION My dear friend, be sure that if you remain faithful to the interior and exterior practices of this devotion which I will point out, the following effects will be produced in your soul. 1. Knowledge of our unworthiness. By the light which the Holy Spirit will give you through Mary, his faithful spouse, you will perceive the evil inclinations of your fallen nature, and how incapable you are of any good apart from that which God produces in you as author of nature and of grace. As a consequence of this knowledge you will despise yourself, and think of yourself only as an object of repugnance. You will consider yourself as a snail that soils everything with its slime, as a toad that poisons everything with its venom, as a malevolent serpent seeking only to deceive. Finally, the humble Virgin Mary will share her humility with you, so that, although you regard yourself with distaste and desire to be disregarded by others, you will not look down slightingly upon any one. Two. A SHARE IN MARY'S FAITH Mary will share her faith with you. Her faith on earth was stronger than that of all the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and saints. Now that she is reigning in heaven, she no longer has this faith, since she sees everything clearly in God by the light of glory. However, with the consent of Almighty God, she did not lose it when entering heaven. She has preserved it for her faithful servants in the church militant. Therefore, the more you gain the friendship of this noble queen and faithful virgin, the more you will be inspired by faith in your daily life. It will cause you to depend less upon sensible and extraordinary feelings. For it is a lively faith, animated by love, enabling you to do everything from no other motive than that of pure love. It is a firm faith, unshakable as a rock, prompting you to remain firm and steadfast in the midst of storms and tempests. It is an active and probing faith, which, like some mysterious paskey, admits you into the mysteries of Jesus Christ, and of man's final destiny, and into the very heart of God Himself. It is a courageous faith, which inspires you to undertake and carry out without hesitation great things for God, and the salvation of souls. Lastly, this faith will be your flaming torch, 
your very life with God, your secret fund of divine wisdom, and an all-powerful weapon for you to enlighten those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. It inflames those who are lukewarm and need the gold of fervent love. It restores life to those who are dead through sin. It moves and transforms hearts of marble and cedars of Lebanon by gentle and convincing argument. Finally, this faith will strengthen you to resist the devil and the other enemies of salvation. 3. THE GIFT OF PURE LOVE The mother of fair love will rid your heart of all scruples and inordinate servile fear. She will open and enlarge it to obey the commandments of her son with alacrity and with the holy freedom of the children of God. She will fill your heart with pure love of which she is the treasury. You will then cease to act as you did before, out of fear of the God who is love, but rather out of pure love. You will look upon him as a loving father, and endeavor to please him at all times. You will speak trustfully to him as a child does to his father. If you should have the misfortune to offend him, you will abase yourself before him, and humbly beg his pardon. You will offer your hand to him with simplicity, and lovingly rise from your sin. Then, peaceful and relaxed and buoyed up with hope, you will continue on your way to him. 4. GREAT CONFIDENCE IN GOD AND IN MARY Our Blessed Lady will fill you with unbounded confidence in God and in herself, because you will no longer approach Jesus by yourself, but always through Mary, your loving mother. Since you have given her all your merits, graces, and satisfactions to dispose of as she pleases, she imparts to you her own virtues, and clothes you in her own merits. So you will be able to say confidently to God, Behold, Mary, your handmaid, be it done unto me according to your word. Since you have now given yourself completely to Mary, body and soul, she who is generous to the generous, and more generous than even the kindest benefactor, will in turn give herself to you in a marvellous but real manner. Indeed, you may without hesitation say to her, I am yours, O blessed Virgin, obtain salvation for me. Or with the beloved disciple, St. John, I have taken you, blessed Mother, for my all. Or again, you may say with St. Bonaventure, Dear Mother of saving grace, I will do everything with confidence and without fear, because you are my strength and my boast in the Lord. Or in another place, I am all yours, and all that I have is yours, O glorious Virgin, blessed above all created things. Let me place you as a seal upon my heart, for your love is as strong as death. Or adopting the sentiments of the prophet, Lord, my heart has no reason to be exalted, nor should my looks be proud. I have not sought things of great moment, nor wonders beyond my reach. Nevertheless, I am still not humble. But I have roused my soul and taken courage. I am as a child, weaned from earthly pleasures and resting on its mother's breast. It is upon this breast that all good things come to me. What will still further increase your confidence in her is that after having given her in trust all that you possess to use or keep as she pleases, you will place less trust in yourself and much more in her whom you have made your treasury. How comforting and how consoling when a person can say, The treasury of God, where he has placed all that he holds most precious, is also my treasury. She is, says a saintly man, the treasury of the Lord. 5. COMMUNICATION OF THE SPIRIT OF MARY The soul of Mary will be communicated to you to glorify the Lord. Her spirit will take the place of yours to rejoice in God, her Saviour, but only if you are faithful to the practices of this devotion. As St. Ambrose says, May the soul of Mary be in each one of us to glorify the Lord. May the spirit of Mary be in each one of us to rejoice in God. When will that happy day come, asks a saintly man of our own day, whose life was completely wrapped up in Mary, when God's mother is enthroned in men's hearts as queen, subjecting them to the dominion of her great and princely son? When will souls breathe Mary as the body breathes air? When that time comes, wonderful things will happen on earth. The Holy Spirit, finding his dear spouse present again in souls, will come down to them with greater power. He will fill them with his gifts, especially wisdom, by which they will produce wonders of grace. My dear friend, when will that happy time come, that age of Mary, when many souls, chosen by Mary, and given her by the Most High God, will hide themselves completely in the depths of her soul, becoming living copies of her, loving and glorifying Jesus. That day will dawn only when the devotion I teach is understood and put into practice. Ut adveniat regnum tuum, adveniat regnum Mariae. 
Lord, that your kingdom may come, may the reign of Mary come. 6. Transformation into the likeness of Jesus If Mary, the tree of life, is well cultivated in our soul by fidelity to this devotion, she will in due time bring forth her fruit, which is none other than Jesus. I have seen many devout souls searching for Jesus in one way or another, and so often when they have worked hard throughout the night, all they can say is, Despite our having worked all night, we have caught nothing. To them we can say, You have worked hard and gained little. Jesus can only be recognized faintly in you. But if we follow the immaculate path of Mary, living the devotion that I teach, we will always work in daylight, we will work in a holy place, and we will work but little. There is no darkness in Mary, not even the slightest shadow, since there was never any sin in her. She is a holy place, a holy of holies, in which saints are formed and moulded. Please note that I say that saints are moulded in Mary. There is a vast difference between carving a statue by blows of hammer and chisel, and making a statue by using a mould. Sculptors and statue-makers work hard, and need plenty of time to make statues by the first method. But the second method does not involve much work, and takes very little time. St. Augustine, speaking to our Blessed Lady, says, You are worthy to be called the mould of God. Mary is a mould capable of forming people into the image of the God-man. Anyone who is cast into this divine mould is quickly shaped and moulded into Jesus, and Jesus into Him. At little cost, and in a short time, he will become Christ-like, since he is cast into the very same mould that fashioned a God-man. I think I can very well compare some spiritual directors and devout persons to sculptors who wish to produce Jesus in themselves and in others by methods other than this. Many of them rely on their own skill, ingenuity, and art, and chip away endlessly with mallet and chisel at hard stone or badly prepared wood, in an effort to produce a likeness of our Lord. At times, they do not manage to produce a recognizable likeness, either because they lack knowledge and experience of the person of Jesus, or because a clumsy stroke has spoiled the whole work. But those who accept this little-known secret of grace which I offer them, can rightly be compared to smelters and moulders, who have discovered the beautiful mould of Mary, where Jesus was so divinely and so naturally formed. They do not rely on their own skill, but on the perfection of the mould. They cast and lose themselves in Mary, where they become true models of her son. You may think this a beautiful and convincing comparison, but how many understand it? I would like you, my dear friend, to understand it. But remember that only molten and liquefied substances may be poured into a mould. That means that you must crush and melt down the old Adam in you, if you wish to acquire the likeness of the new Adam in Mary. 7. THE GREATER GLORY OF CHRIST if you live this devotion sincerely, you will give more glory to Jesus in a month than in many years of a more demanding devotion. Here are my reasons for saying this. 1. Since you do everything through the Blessed Virgin as required by this devotion, you naturally lay aside your intentions, no matter how good they appear to you. You abandon yourself to Our Lady's intentions, even though you do not know what they are. Thus, you share in the high quality of her intentions, which are so pure that she gave more glory to God by the smallest of her actions, say, twirling her distaff, or making a stitch, than did St. Lawrence, suffering his cruel martyrdom on the gridiron, and even more than all the saints together in all their most heroic deeds. Mary amassed such a multitude of merits and graces during her sojourn on earth, that it would be easier to count the stars in heaven, the drops of water in the ocean, or the sands of the seashore, than count her merits and graces. She thus gave more glory to God than all the angels and saints have given, or will ever give Him. Mary, wonder of God, when souls abandon themselves to you, you cannot but work wonders in them. 2. In this devotion we set no store on our own thoughts and actions, but are content to rely on Mary's dispositions when approaching and even speaking to Jesus. We then act with far greater humility than others who imperceptibly rely on their own dispositions, and are self-satisfied about them. And consequently, we give greater glory to God, for perfect glory is given to Him only by the lowly and humble of heart. 3. Our Blessed Lady, in her immense love for us, is eager to receive into her virginal hands the gift of our actions, imparting to them a marvellous beauty and splendour, and presenting them herself to Jesus most willingly. 
More glory is given to our Lord in this way than when we make our offering with our own guilty hands. 4. Lastly, you never think of Mary without Mary thinking of God for you. You never praise or honor Mary without Mary joining you in praising and honoring God. Mary is entirely relative to God. Indeed, I would say that she was relative only to God, because she exists uniquely in reference to Him. She is an echo of God, speaking and repeating only God. If you say Mary, she says God. When St. Elizabeth praised Mary, calling her blessed because she had believed, Mary, the faithful echo of God, responded with her canticle, My soul glorifies the Lord. What Mary did on that day, she does every day. When we praise her, when we love and honor her, when we present anything to her, then God is praised, honored, and loved, and receives our gift, through Mary and in Mary. Chapter 7 Particular Practices of this Devotion 1. Exterior Practices Although this devotion is essentially an interior one, this does not prevent it from having exterior practices which should not be neglected. These must be done, but those not omitted. If properly performed, exterior acts help to foster interior ones. Man is always guided by his senses, and such practices remind him of what he has done or should do. Let no worldling or critic intervene to assert that true devotion is essentially in the heart, and therefore externals should be avoided as inspiring vanity, or that real devotion should be hidden in private. I answer in the words of our Lord, Let men see your good works, that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. As St. Gregory says, this does not mean that they should perform external actions to please men or seek praise. That certainly would be vanity. It simply means that we do these things before men only to please and glorify God, without worrying about either the contempt or the approval of men. I shall briefly mention some practices which I call exterior, not because they are performed without inner attention, but because they have an exterior element, as distinct from those which are purely interior. Preparation and Consecration Those who desire to take up this special devotion, which has not been erected into a confraternity, although this would be desirable, should spend at least twelve days in emptying themselves of the spirit of the world, which is opposed to the spirit of Jesus, as I have recommended in the first part of this preparation for the reign of Jesus Christ. They should then spend three weeks imbuing themselves with the spirit of Jesus through the Most Blessed Virgin. Here is a program they might follow. During the first week, they should offer up all their prayers and acts of devotion to acquire knowledge of themselves and sorrow for their sins. Let them perform all their actions in a spirit of humility. With this end in view, they may, if they wish, meditate on what I have said concerning our corrupted nature, and consider themselves during six days of the week as nothing but snails, slugs, toads, swine, snakes, and goats. Or else they may meditate on the following three considerations of St. Bernard. Remember what you were, corrupted seed, what you are, a body destined for decay, what you will be, food for worms. They will ask our Lord and the Holy Spirit to enlighten them, saying, Lord, that I may see, or Lord, let me know myself, or the Come Holy Spirit. Every day they should say the litany of the Holy Spirit, with the prayer that follows, as indicated in the first part of this work. They will turn to our Blessed Lady, and beg her to obtain for them that great grace which is the foundation of all others, the grace of self-knowledge. For this intention they will say each day the Ave Maris Stella, and the Litany of the Blessed Virgin. Each day of the second week they should endeavor in all their prayers and works to acquire an understanding of the Blessed Virgin, and ask the Holy Spirit for this grace. They may read and meditate upon what we have already said about her. They should recite daily the Litany of the Holy Spirit and the Ave Maris Stella, as during the first week. In addition, they will say at least five decades of the Rosary for greater understanding of Mary. During the third week they should seek to understand Jesus Christ better. They may read and meditate on what we have already said about Him. They may say the prayer of St. Augustine, which they will find at the beginning of the second part of this book. Again with St. Augustine, they may pray repeatedly, Lord, that I may know you or Lord that I may see. As during the previous week, they should recite the Litany of the Holy Spirit and the Ave Maris Stella, adding every day the Litany of the Holy Name of Jesus. At the end of these three weeks they should go to confession and holy communion with the intention of consecrating themselves to Jesus through Mary as slaves of love. 
When receiving Holy Communion, they could follow the method given later on. They then recite the act of consecration which is given at the end of this book. If they do not have a printed copy of the act, they should write it out, or have it copied and then sign it on the very day they make it. It would be very becoming if on that day they offered some tribute to Jesus and His Mother, either as a penance for past unfaithfulness to the promises made in baptism, or as a sign of their submission to the sovereignty of Jesus and Mary. Such a tribute would be in accordance with each one's ability and fervour, and may take the form of fasting, an act of self-denial, the gift of an alms, or the offering of a votive candle. If they gave only a pin as a token of their homage, provided it were given with a good heart, it would satisfy Jesus, who considers only the good intention. Every year at least, on the same date, they should renew the consecration, following the same exercises for three weeks. They might also renew it every month, or even every day, by saying this short prayer, I am all yours, and all I have is yours, O dear Jesus, through Mary your holy mother. THE LITTLE CROWN OF THE BLESSED VIRGIN If it is not too inconvenient, they should recite every day of their lives the little crown of the Blessed Virgin, which is composed of three Our Fathers and twelve Hail Marys, in honour of the twelve glorious privileges of Mary. This prayer is very old, and is based on Holy Scripture. St. John saw in a vision a woman crowned with twelve stars, clothed with the sun and standing upon the moon. According to biblical commentators, this woman is the Blessed Virgin. There are several ways of saying the little crown, but it would take too long to explain them here. The Holy Spirit will teach them to those who live this devotion conscientiously. However, here is a simple way to recite it. As an introduction, say, Virgin most holy, accept my praise. Give me strength to fight your foes. Then say the creed. Next say the following sequence of prayers three times. One Our Father, four Hail Marys, one Glory be to the Father. In conclusion, say the prayer sub tuum, we fly to thy patronage. Wearing of Little Chains It is very praiseworthy and helpful for those who have become slaves of Jesus and Mary to wear, in token of their slavery of love, a little chain blessed with a special blessing. It is perfectly true, these external tokens are not essential, and may very well be dispensed with by those who have made this consecration. Nevertheless, I cannot help but give the warmest approval to those who wear them. They show they have shaken off the shameful chains of the slavery of the devil, in which original sin, and perhaps actual sin, had bound them, and have willingly taken upon themselves the glorious slavery of Jesus Christ. Like St. Paul, they glory in the chains they wear for Christ. For though these chains are made only of iron, they are far more glorious and precious than all the gold ornaments worn by monarchs. At one time, Nothing was considered more contemptible than the cross. Now this sacred wood has become the most glorious symbol of the Christian faith. Similarly, nothing was more ignoble than the sight of the ancients, and even today nothing is more degrading among unbelievers than the chains of Jesus Christ. But among Christians nothing is more glorious than these chains, because by them Christians are liberated and kept free from the ignoble shackles of sin and the devil. Thus set free, we are bound to Jesus and Mary, not by compulsion and force like galley slaves, but by charity and love, as children are to their parents. I shall draw them to me by chains of love, said God Most High, speaking through the prophet. Consequently, these chains are as strong as death, and in a way stronger than death, for those who wear them faithfully till the end of their life. For though death destroys and corrupts their body, it will not destroy the chains of their slavery since these, being of metal, will not easily corrupt. It may be that on the day of their resurrection, that momentous day of final judgment, these chains, still clinging to their bones, will contribute to their glorification, and be transformed into chains of light and splendor. Happy, then, a thousand times happy, are the illustrious slaves of Jesus and Mary, who bear their chains even to the grave. Here are the reasons for wearing these chains. They remind a Christian of the promises of his baptism and the perfect renewal of these commitments made in his consecration. They remind him of his strict obligation to adhere faithfully to them. A man's actions are prompted more frequently by his senses than by pure faith, and so he can easily forget his duties towards God, if he has no external reminder of them. These little chains are a wonderful aid in recalling the bonds of sin and the slavery of the devil from which baptism has freed him. 
At the same time, they remind him of the dependence on Jesus promised at baptism, and ratified when, by consecration, he renewed these promises. Why is it that so many Christians do not think of their baptismal vows, and behave with as much license as unbelievers who have promised nothing to God? One explanation is that they do not wear external sign to remind them of these vows. These chains prove that they are not ashamed of being servants and slaves of Jesus, and that they reject the deadly bondage of the world, of sin, and of the devil. They are a guarantee and protection against enslavement by sin and the devil. For we must of necessity choose to wear either the chains of sin and damnation, or the chains of love and salvation. Dear friend, break the chains of sin and of sinners, of the world and the worldly, of the devil and his satellites. Cast their yoke of death far from us. To use the words of the Holy Spirit, let us put our feet into His glorious shackles, and our neck into His chains. Let us bow down our shoulders in submission to the yoke of wisdom incarnate, Jesus Christ, and let us not be upset by the burden of His chains. Notice how, before saying these words, the Holy Spirit prepares us to accept His serious advice. Hearken, my son, He says, receive a counsel of understanding, and do not spurn this counsel of mine. Allow me here, my dear friend, to join the Holy Spirit in giving you the same counsel. These chains are the chains of salvation. As our Lord on the cross draws all men to Himself, whether they will it or not, He will draw sinners by the fetters of their sins, and submit them like galley-slaves and devils to His eternal anger and avenging justice. But He will draw the just, especially in these latter days, by the chains of love. These loving slaves of Christ may wear their chains around the neck, on their arms, round the waist, or round the ankles. Father Vincent Carafa, seventh general of the Society of Jesus, who died a holy death in 1643, carried an iron band round his ankles as a symbol of his holy servitude, and he used to say that his greatest regret was that he could not drag a chain around in public. Mother Agnes of Jesus, of whom we have already spoken, wore a chain around her waist. Others have worn it round the neck, in atonement for the pearl necklaces they wore in the world. Others have worn chains round their arms, to remind them, as they work with their hands, that they are the slaves of Jesus. 4. Honoring the Mystery of the Incarnation Loving slaves of Jesus and Mary should hold in high esteem devotion to Jesus, the Word of God, in the great mystery of the Incarnation, March 25th which is the mystery proper to this devotion, because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit for the following reasons. a. That we might honor and imitate the wondrous dependence which God the Son chose to have on Mary, for the glory of His Father and for the redemption of man. This dependence is revealed especially in this mystery, where Jesus becomes a captive and slave in the womb of His Blessed Mother, depending on her for everything. b that we might thank God for the incomparable graces He has conferred upon Mary, and especially that of choosing her to be His most worthy mother. This choice was made in the mystery of the Incarnation. These are the two principal ends of the slavery of Jesus and Mary. Please note that I usually say, slave of Jesus and Mary, slavery of Jesus and Mary. We might indeed say, as some have already been saying, slave of Mary, slavery of Mary, but I think it preferable to say, Slave of Jesus and Mary. This is the opinion of Father Tronson, Superior General of the Seminary of St. Sulpice, a man renowned for his exceptional prudence and remarkable holiness. He gave this advice when consulted upon this subject by a priest. Here are the reasons for it. Since we live in an age of pride, when a great number of haughty scholars with proud and critical minds find fault even with long-established and sound devotions, it is better to speak of slavery of Jesus and Mary, and to call oneself slave of Jesus rather than slave of Mary. We then avoid giving any pretext for criticism. In this way, we name this devotion after its ultimate end, which is Jesus, rather than after the way and the means to arrive there, which is Mary. However, we can very well use either term without any scruple, as I myself do. If a man goes from Orléans to Tours by way of Amboise, he can quite truthfully say that he is going to Amboise, and equally truthfully say that he is going to Tours. The only difference is that Amboise is simply a place on the direct road to Tours, and Tours alone is his final destination. 